here on one of those weekends. Um, listen, I want to address the Caleb picture. Uh, first of all, if you think the top is great, you should see the bottom half of that. Uh, just kidding, that's a joke. Uh, the other one is... <laughs> The other one is Caleb did an amazing job and I would never embarrass him. Uh, he did so good that his mom was recording in the second row, so it's great. <laughs> she was, that's a true story, it's adorable. Uh, hey, listen, I, I'm really excited to get to teach today. This, uh, this, this kind of bridge series we're doing is called Rethink. And so like Jim said, like over the past few months, we've been listening to, to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and it's caused a lot of us to have to rethink stuff. And we're going to step in this man series next week, and I think there's going to be some big challenges, and we're going to have to rethink some stuff. And, you know, I, I've been excited getting ready for this, and it's been interesting preparing for it, because like th- what, I'm, what I'm talking about today has been a process of like two months, three months of me, of me trying to figure something out. And, uh, and, and so I started writing this back in December, but I didn't really get to work on it until the first, like New Year's Eve. Um, and so like almost no one was in the office. I was down at our Lafayette offices and, and pretty much everyone had the day off. And by 2 p.m. I was literally alone in the building, which is great. Like I got a ton of work done until uh, 4 p.m. when I was also alone, when I walked out of my office, turned a corner and saw what appeared to be a stream of water running through our hallway, which isn't good. It's not normal. <laughs> You know, it's not been there before. And so I'm, so honestly, my, this is totally true. My first thought was like, did I clog the toilet two hours ago? Cause like I ate corn. I don't know, you know? And if I did, I am fired, <laughs> but you'll be happy to know I didn't. I ran into the, the bathroom, looked at the toilet and it was not flowing. It looked totally normal other than the fact there was a half inch of water. And so then I turned around and I saw a floor drain that had what I can only describe as a geyser coming out of it. Uh, so if we open Flatirons Yellowstone, it's great, and then we shut it down immediately for the shutdown. Uh, and so, so I, I called our exec pastor, and I'm like, uh, the halls are flooding. What do I do? And he's like, okay, don't worry. I'll take care of it. Could you just look around and see if we have any mops? I was like, um, deal. We're going to need more than a mop because it's covering like 20 offices. It's great. And so we got three mops. Uh, and we, fortunately, the geyser somehow randomly stopped, and we, uh, we went ahead and mopped for a while, and I got out of there at around like 7 p.m., got back home to my wife to celebrate New Year's Eve by going to bed early because we had sent our kids to the grandparents' house, and there is no way I'm giving up sleep on that night, right, <laughs> young parents? Midnight looks the same tomorrow as it does today, just saying. I'll look at the clock at noon and just pretend. So, so here's the thing, though. 2018 for me let, ended in a literal flood of crap. So when I woke up on 2019 and I stepped down on the floor, I'm like, this is good just by not being that. Like, oh, this year's already starting out great, you know? And that's, that is kind of what, what all the New Year's stuff is about, funnily enough, right? Like, we, we look at 2018 and we're like, hey, there's some stuff that didn't go that well, or I wish it was better, or yeah, it was good, but I think I could really improve, and so I'm going to rethink some things and move into 2019, right? That's true for me. I don't know, like, a lot of you guys have heard some of my year. Like, it was a good year. It was. Like, we opened this building, and my daughter had her third birthday. My son had his first birthday. We bought a house. We had tons of fun. Like we, we got to know some of you here in Longmont. And also it was kind of a tough year at times, partly because of some of those things. But, you know, I, I figured out that I struggle with anxiety and depression. I've been really open about that one. I took an extra pill today, so we're fine. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> it, it was a mixed year. And so I'm looking at 2019 saying, man, I, I, this was a good year. I still hope 2019 is better. I'm rethinking some things. And I'm, I'm hoping it, it changes my year. And that idea of rethinking, of looking at our life and saying, hey, well, what if it could be different is actually really foundational to what Jesus taught. Like, how about this? From that time, which is when Jesus started preaching, this is in the book of Matthew, from that time, Jesus began preaching, or began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the word repent there just means rethink. Like literally, rethink everything. Like, hey, you've been living your life this way and doing these things. Is it working for you? And if not, rethink some things because the kingdom of heaven, like a with God kind of life, it's actually available. Like you could have that, but you're going to have to rethink some stuff. And that's what we call spiritual formation around here. Like I'm, I'm letting go of some old ways of thinking and living, and I'm taking hold of some new ones that bring me closer to God. That's it. 
And so I had a conversation a couple months ago that got me rethinking something. And honestly, it got me rethinking this whole spiritual formation thing. Not like, should we do it? But like, why do we do it? So I was on a trip to Mexico with, uh, visiting one of our partners. It was a mission trip. Took a bunch of people down there. And, and we had a great time like, getting to connect with our partner, Urban Mosaic. But one of the nights, we were just hanging out. And we were on like a porch at the guest house. And we got talking. And I was talking with a, a young guy who honestly is incredibly sincere in his faith. He's really trying to figure out what it means to chase Jesus. But as he was talking about this, he's like, hey, I know that God says this. Like, I know that my life doesn't line up with that. But honestly, I don't see why I should change because it's kind of okay. Like I know, it's, I'm, I see maybe these consequences, but honestly, like I like this. Why, why would I give it up? And even if I don't agree with that, like I see the point, right? Like I, I didn't, I intentionally left that vague because I think we just filled in the blanks in that with 20 different things through this room. Right? Like, hey, I know, like, I've been listening to the Sermon on the Mount stuff. Like, I know God said this. I know, how about this one? Like, I know God said I should be generous, but like, honestly, I just like having my money. That makes sense. I get that. I know God said to take care of the poor, but honestly, some of them seem dangerous, and I like being safe. I get that one. How about this one? I heard this one a lot from, from one of the messages Jim taught. Hey, I know God says that I should stop being angry, but honestly, it is all I have left. It's the only way that I can see to not let them win. And Ben's had a great message about that, about how that's maybe not the case, but we got to rethink it. I, I, I know Jesus says I shouldn't sleep with him or her, but if it feels good, why, why should I stop? And here's the thing, even if I disagreed with it, what I realized in that conversation was I could not articulate a reason why someone who didn't want to change or didn't want to follow Jesus should do it. If you didn't see the reason, I was like, I don't, yeah, you're right. Like, I can convince you that Jesus is a good guy, but like, why, why would you follow him? Like, why should you think that following Jesus would result in any different results than what you've gotten the whole time? And why should you trust him to take you somewhere good? It's a good question. And it's, honestly, I've been thinking about it a lot. And here's, here's where I've landed. I think it comes down to, to, these, to these things. Like, you have to answer this. Who do you think Jesus is, and what does he think about you? Who do you think Jesus is, and what does he think about you? Those, the answer to those two questions will tell you, like, hey, should you follow Jesus? And, and how? And the best way I can explain this is a story of a guy named Simon Peter. So Simon Peter, he's like a pretty famous guy in the Bible. He's probably the second most famous person in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes the Bible calls him Simon. Sometimes it calls him Peter. I'm going to call him both a little bit today, but mostly Peter. Same guy, though. Okay, so Simon Peter, he meets Jesus one day when his buddies come over, and they're like, hey, dude, you got to meet this guy. His name's Jesus, and he's dope. And Simon Peter's like, great, let's do that. That's the message translation. And so <laughs> Peter goes, and he hangs, <laughs> he hangs out with Jesus. And the whole time, he and his friends are calling him Rabbi. Say, hey, Rabbi, what, what do you think about this? Rabbi, what do you think about that? And, and Rabbi is a word that we translate as teacher, but literally it means guy who knows a lot of stuff. And so they're like, hey, you know some things. We want to hear them and see if it's any good. Would you just teach us? And so a couple days later, fast forward, Jesus is walking along a lake. And he, he's got this huge crowd of people around him. And that's not that unusual. Like that happens a lot. Like Jesus is a rabbi. People are like, hey, you know some stuff and we want to hear it. And so this day though, he's so crowded. Like there's so many people that he can barely walk along the side of the lake. And then he looks over and sees a boat. And right next to it is Simon, Peter, right? So Peter's right next to it, cleaning his nets. And he's just been out fishing for like the whole night and he's caught nothing. There's nothing. He doesn't have any fish. All he's cleaning is nets. And so he's like, okay, I'm done. I'm going home. But Jesus sees, sees Peter, sees his boat, and he steps in the boat, which I think is funny, right? Because like if you were sitting there and you're like, oh, I'm going home for the day, and some dude's just like, hey, and steps in your boat, I think that's funny. <laughs> and so, so here's what the Bible says. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And here's what I think is interesting here. Jesus asks Simon. He's like, hey, would you put, would you put this out into the water? And that's, that's a little bit unusual because most of the time when we see Jesus talking to people, he, he tells them to do something because he has authority, right? He's a rabbi, he's a teacher. And so he could have told Simon like, hey, come on, let's go. Also, he's God, like he could have pulled rank, right? And there's a huge mob of people around him. So at the very least, he could be like, what's up guys, grab that boat, let's go. But he doesn't. He doesn't say that. He asks, he says, hey, would you put this boat out into the water? And so I had to wonder, like, why is he doing that? And here's what I think. 
I think he's giving Peter the dignity of deciding where his boat goes. I think he's giving Peter the dignity of owning his own boat, and I think that's how God works a lot of times. Like he says, hey, I wanna step into your life, but I'm gonna give you the dignity of owning your life. I don't wanna push you, but here, how about this? Would you just push out into the water and listen to what I have to say? That's it, Peter, just push out into the water and, and listen to what I have to say. God's given you the dignity of your owning your own life, of owning your own boat. Doesn't mean he doesn't want it, and he does. And so he steps into Peter's boat and he's like, hey, can, would you just push out into the water and listen to me as I teach? And so Peter says, yeah, let's do it. And, and so they push out into the water and here's what it says. And he, Jesus, sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, so Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And so you kind of have to understand like the, how ridiculous this moment is. Cause like I, Jesus grew up as a carpenter. He has never, as far as we know, gone fishing. Like he doesn't know anything about fish. And he's saying to the guy who owns the boat, Peter, right? The guy who has been fishing all night and has caught nothing. The guy whose dad and grandpa were probably fishermen. And so he's like, hey bro, I know there's no fish out there. They weren't there an hour ago. They're not gonna be there now. And I just finished cleaning my nets. Jesus is saying to that guy, hey, go ahead and throw your clean nets out and pull up what you catch. Like, that's a bad idea. <laughs> like, Jesus, what are, you, what are you thinking? That doesn't make any sense. And so here's the thing. Here's how, here's how Peter answers them. And Simon, Peter, answered, Master, we toiled all night long and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And so Peter agrees to it. But, but the word master there is important. He's not agreeing to it because he thinks like, yeah, that's a good idea. He's saying, hey, master. He's not calling him a rabbi anymore. He's calling him master. See, rabbi is a teacher, someone who knows a lot. Master is somebody who has authority. So Peter's saying like, hey, I, I've heard what you have to say. I think you've got some good stuff. So you know what? I'll, I'll follow you. W would you mentor me? Tell me the rules. I'll, I'll try it out and see how it goes. And <laughs> the thing I never realized until I started studying this was that uh, the word for master is also the word for a ship's commander. So I always thought it was like this really respectful thing like master. Yes, I will let my nets down. It's not. It's the commander of a ship. So he's actually saying, if I could do the Stephen translation, like, aye, aye, captain, whatever. We fished all night long, but there's nothing there. So batten down the hatches, shiver me timbers, walk the plank and throw it on out. <laughs> right? Like he's being sarcastic. And I never realized that that might be there. And when I did, I was like, okay, I get that. I get that because when Peter's like, okay, sure, I'll throw this out and it's a bad idea. I'm like, what are you doing, Peter? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I'm cynical. <laughs> Why would you do that? But when, but when he says this, when he's like, okay, listen, that doesn't make any sense to me, but you know what? I trust you, Jesus. That one I get. Because I've spent a lot of my life struggling with doubt. And honestly, if I look through the Bible, there are plenty of places where I'm like, man, I don't get that. Like, I don't know why God said that. Honestly, there's places that I'm like, I don't like that God says that. And as I've gone through those seasons of doubt where I'm like, hey, and I'm, I'm an agnostic. No, I'm a Christian again. No, I'm atheist, hardcore. No, I'm following Jesus all out. Like as I've gone through those seasons, what's happened is I've grown in trust to know that who Jesus is, is good. And so if he's telling me to do something, man, it might be good. And so now, even if I don't understand it, God, now I'll go out on a limb for you. That's what Peter's doing. He's saying, okay, I've gained a little bit of trust in you, so I'll throw my net out. And here's what happens. So Peter and his brothers, they let the nets down and they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So Peter here has changed something again. He's not calling him master now, it's Lord, Lord. And so as he sees these fish pile up and as he watches the water pour over the sides of the boat, he's like, oh man, this guy is not just a master. There's something different about him. You are Lord. And that was the word for king or for God. And so Peter's basically saying like, oh man, okay, I get it. You are either God or Aquaman because you can control fish. But, <laughs> but why are you in my sinking boat? Please don't take this away from me. Please don't take this away from me because it's all I got left. Why would you want to be here with me, Jesus? And so we don't know a lot about Peter's life before this, but one thing we do know is that he was a good Jewish kid. Okay, and we also find out later that, that he wasn't very educated. And so for a good Jewish kid living in that time, honestly, the height, of, the height of society probably would have been becoming a rabbi. 
but he wasn't very educated. So we know that if he actually did get there, he probably flunked out. And so Peter's like, hey, listen, the best hope I have for my life is this fishing boat that my dad passed down to me. And I'm just going to try to be the best fisherman I can and make my dad proud. And maybe somehow I'll sneak into to the Jewish elite or heaven or something. Just let me have this boat. Just don't take it away from me. And I get that because I think it mirrors a lot of our stories, right? Like all of a sudden we go from, hey, Jesus maybe has some good ideas to like, oh my gosh, maybe Jesus is something more. Maybe he's God, maybe he knows me and maybe he made me. And if that's the case, I don't think I'm good enough for this. That's my story. Five years ago, I had a young marriage and I was pretty new to ministry and I was angry just pretty much all the time. I was angry. And and honestly, a big part of it came from like this really deep-seated insecurity where I was like literally walking around thinking, oh man, if people knew me, they would not like me. If people got to know me, they they wouldn't like me. Like people would give me a compliment and I'd be like, yeah, that's cool that you think that, but honestly, I don't think you mean it. You're just trying to be nice. Because if you knew me, you wouldn't say that. And I know I'm not the only one who does that because I've told people that story before and they're like, oh man, me too. And so then, you know, you get into this weird headspace of, of we say stuff like, okay, God, God doesn't use people like me. Like God doesn't use people who, have, who, who don't read their Bible enough or don't pray enough. God doesn't use people who, you know, have messed up their sexuality. He doesn't use people who are insecure. He doesn't use people who cuss too much. He doesn't use people like me. And then we shut it down and we're like, this is, all, I have, all I have is this little piece of life. All I have is this one thing. Please, God, don't take that away from me. I, I don't think I can let it go because if, I don't know if I'm going to get good if I let go of it. This might be the last thing I have. And I get that. And so here's what happened for me. Uh, a few years ago, I went to this thing called Crucible and, and God worked in my life in a huge way there. And I started seeing like, hey, actually, maybe I'm made for something bigger. Maybe God did put some good stuff in my life. Maybe God did mean to make me. Maybe that wasn't just a mistake. And it started a journey. I'm not totally fixed, right? Hence the meds. I'm not totally fixed, but I'm on the way. I'm a lot farther along. And so here's, Peter is about to start that journey because what, Peter, what Jesus says to him, he doesn't, he doesn't, like as Peter falls down and he's like, oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. What Jesus doesn't say is like, oh, it's okay, Peter. You're not that bad. It's okay, Peter, look at all the awesome fishing knots you can tie. They're so good. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says this, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Or maybe you've heard it in a different retelling of the story. Uh, You'll be a fisher of men, same thing. And so Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, when you fall down and you say, I'm a sinful man, depart from me, I know you don't need to hear, hey, you're okay where you are. I know you need to hear, yeah, think about what you could be. Or maybe this, rethink who you could be because I'm in the boat now. So rethink everything because I know who you are. I know who I made you to be and I know where I can take you. I will bring you along with me if you follow me. I won't do it instead of you, but I will do it with you and I will do it for you. Follow me. And so when they get back to the shore, Jesus says, just that, follow me. It's really simple. And then he, G, uh, Peter and his friends leave everything. They leave it all behind. They leave the boat. They leave the fishing nets. They leave all of it. And it, so it literally says, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And here's the thing. I, when I was growing up, I always heard this story told. And I've even heard it told when I was you know, a little bit older. Like, Jesus walks along and he's like, hey, follow me, guys. And they're like, okay, stranger, whatever. And they leave all their stuff, which is irresponsible. <laughs> That's crazy. And people are like, hey, would you leave everything for Jesus right now? And here's the thing. I don't, if, if that's how that went down, I don't know if I would, right? Like if someone walked up to me and was like, hey, I want you to leave your house and let it go into foreclosure. And I think that's what God wants for you. I'd be like, I think God wants you to pay it off for me instead. <laughs> you know? And so here's, here's, what, here's what I came to is that following Jesus is not like, oh, first time I meet you, come along. See, Jesus earns trust. And the closest relationship I can think to how that works is like a marriage. Like if someone walked up to you in the street and was like, hey, you know what? We should move in together and merge finances and have a baby. You get a restraining order. (laughs) That's not normal. That's not how that relationship works. And on the other hand, if you're like me, it's like my wife and I, we met down at the med in Boulder. 
And a mutual friend just invited us to, to dinner and we hung out and we happened to sit next to each other and we talked the whole time. And by the end of it, we were racing to see who could eat a lemon of fastest, which probably had something to do with the sangria as we drank. I don't know. <laughs> but then we got to know each other. We became friends. And then we started dating and we got to see each other's character and we got to learn what one another were like. And we're like, okay, I think I want to spend my life with you. And then we got engaged and we got married. And then we moved to England together and we had kids together and we've grown together and we fought and we've made up. And now it's like, hey, we've got some trust built. So if my wife walked up to me and said, hey, we've got a great house. We've got these two awesome kids and uh, you know, our finances are looking good. Well, let's have another baby. Then I'd be like, well, we should at least practice, <laughs> you know? Because there's a different level of trust. There's a different level of trust. She's here. <laughs> it's not the first time she's had to apologize for me. It's fine. <laughs> See, Peter, Peter's not like, hey, first time he meets Jesus, go along. What happens is Peter meets Jesus through some mutual friends. They say, come and see. And he listens to Jesus and he gets to know him and he starts to trust him. And he says, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll let you mentor me a little bit. And then he says, okay, I'll throw my nets out. He goes out on a limb. And then it's only after Peter has seen Jesus do something in his life and he's like, oh man, I am not good enough for this. And it's only after Jesus looks at him and says, hey, I see who you could be. Come on, I've got good intentions for you. It's only then that he starts doing crazy stuff. It's only then that he starts leaving everything once he's built up a relationship. And here's the thing. I think this is really cool. And I got like really excited when I realized that Jesus isn't saying, hey, come with me and I'll make you into a completely different person. He's saying, I'll change you. I will, you're gonna change, but he says, he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, hey, come with me and I'll make you a carpenter of hearts. That would make sense, Jesus grew up a carpenter. He doesn't say, come with me and I'll make you a rabbi. He says, come with me and you will catch men instead of fish, and not in a weird way. <laughs> you will catch men instead of fish. You're gonna be fisher of men. You're, gonna, you're going to use, I'm gonna use your life. I'm gonna use who you are right now and what you know to bring you somewhere where you're going to show people how good I am. The old Christian word for this is like, I'm gonna sh you're gonna show people the glory of God. That, that's what he's doing. And so I think this is what got me excited. I think if Jesus was here, he'd say the same kind of thing to us. He would use what we do and what we know and he'd say, hey, you're a doctor. Okay, follow me. I will help you learn how to heal men spiritually as well as physically. You're an accountant? Cool, come with me. I'll teach you how to sort out people's lives. You're a construction worker? Cool, come with me. You'll build men instead of houses. Oh, you think you're just a stay-at-home mom? You come with me and you will raise up children of God. That's really good news. That's cool. Because it's not saying like, hey, once you change everything and come follow me, then you'll be okay enough to get into heaven. It's saying, hey, right now, who you are is made to be something unbelievably beyond what you've imagined. Like, come with me and I will make you into that. I won't do it instead of you, but I'll do it with you. Follow me. And here's the thing, what comes up for me when I first think that is like, what if I mess that up? And the answer is the, the final name that Jesus called, or that Peter called Jesus, which is Christ. Later on down the road, Peter follows him and over and over again keeps messing up. Like he, one day Jesus is talking and Peter's like, hey, Jesus, chill a little bit. And Jesus is like, get away from me, Satan, which seems intense. <laughs> but, but, but Jesus is like, hey, this is not where you need to be. And then like the night before Jesus dies, Peter's like, hey, Jesus, I will never leave you. Everyone else might, but I won't. And Jesus is like, yeah, whatever, Peter. And then the, that, that morning, as Jesus is getting taken away and about to be nailed to a cross, somebody asked Peter, oh, hey, do you know that guy? And Peter's like, nope, nope, ne never met him. Nailed it, Peter. <laughs> See, it's not an accident that in following Jesus, it took Peter right to the foot of the cross because the foot of the cross is where we find out that Jesus said, hey, when you fail to follow me, when you aren't who you are made to be, when you sin, when you mess up, here's me. I will take that on myself and I will let it die with me and so then you can get up and follow me. You have today forward. Can't undo the past, but you do have today forward. And the cool thing is a couple days later, Jesus comes back to life and he, when he's talking to Peter, he says the same thing he said to him the second day they met. He says, hey, follow me. Follow me. See, our, the whole process of following Jesus doesn't change. It's just one step. Like take this step and follow me. Now I'm gonna take this step and you follow me.
but I think it starts with getting to know Jesus. Like Peter doesn't do that before he knows Jesus. He starts, he goes from, hey, you're a rabbi, like you know some stuff, to you're a master, like I wanna try this out, to okay, you're Lord, you made me and you know me, and maybe if that's the case, then what you have is better than what I think. And so who do you think Jesus is? Is he a rabbi, like he's got some stuff to say? Is he a master who you're like, I'll, I'll try some of this out? Or is he Lord? Because I think that that changes things. Because if he's Lord and your li- life isn't lining up with what he says is best, then here's the question. Could you maybe be missing out on something? Are you maybe missing out on, on what God wants for you? Like one of my favorite authors is a guy named C.S. Lewis, and he has this great quote. It says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. So what if following Jesus isn't less than you want for yourself, but more? More than you'd hoped. As I've been rethinking this, I think we make faith way too complicated because here's the thing. If you are made in the image of God, which the Bible says you are, to show his goodness to the world, and it says you are. Here's the thing, you are unique in that. Nobody else is going to show God the same way that you are or know God the same way that you are. And I'm not talking about like a special little snowflake kind of thing. I'm talking about like, hey, secret mission, like God's saying, hey, I made you to express a unique part of who I am. And if you follow me, I will bring that to where it's meant to be and you will show the world how good I am in the way that only you can show it and you will know me in the way that only you can know me. And that's cool. And so how do you do that? I think it's really simple. Follow Jesus, because that's what he was here to do. So if we just follow him, then we're, we're aiming that same direction. And so the night before Jesus died, he said this to some of his friends, whoever has my commandments, whoever hears what I say and keeps them, so does, does that stuff. In other words, like, hey, you're going to come watch what I do, hear what I say, and then kind of go along with me. You're going to follow me. He it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And manifest basically means this. It means I'll show myself to him. I'll let you know who I really am. You'll get to know me. And that is literally the definition of eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So following the rules has never and will never be about being good little boys and girls or avoiding punishment or getting the right things or even getting into heaven. It's not about that. It's about knowing Jesus. Because anything else is some weird bribe where we think of like people sitting on cloud benches wearing weird bathrobes that they stole from some fancy hotel with gold things around the middle of it playing harps. And that's not what eternal life is meant to look like. It's meant to look like we follow Jesus and we become who we're really meant to be. And that's cool. And here's the thing, it's a journey. So no matter where you are on that, like the second day Jesus met Peter and the last time they talked face to face here on this earth, it was follow me, just take one step. One step is enough to follow Jesus. See, Jesus didn't tell Peter like, hey, you should follow me until I'm executed. That would have freaked Peter out, (laughs) right? He just says, hey, follow me, this step, and then this step, and then this step. And then Peter goes and preaches a sermon where 3,000 people get baptized, and you look at the end of Peter's life, and he's the second most famous person in the New Testament. He's one of Jesus' best friends. He has one of two people who've walked on water. He started the church. He taught thousands of people about Jesus while he was alive, and billions of people know Jesus because of him. And he was an uneducated fisherman whose best hope was, man, please don't take my boat. Don't take my boat because it's all I got left. So here's the question. Are are we clinging to something that maybe is less than what we're made for? Are you clinging to something that's less than what you're made for? So who do you think Jesus is? Because I think that determines what your next steps are because following Jesus just takes one step, right? So do you think maybe he's a rabbi? I talked to someone today who's like, "I I don't believe this stuff but maybe Jesus has something to say. That's, he's a rabbi. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say. Maybe your next step is just coming here for the next few weeks and hearing what, what Jesus has to say about masculinity and comparing it to culture and seeing like, hey, does it make sense? Is he worth following? Are you like, hey, I think Jesus is a master. Like he's got some good stuff to say and I'm, I'm lining my life up with it, but honestly, there's stuff, I, I don't wanna change this. I don't wanna do that because I don't know if I can trust Jesus and that makes sense. It does. And here's the thing, I can't convince you that he's trustworthy. I can't. Fortunately, Jesus is a big boy and he can take care of himself. And so here's here's what your next step might be. 
why don't you read through the life of Jesus? We posted on our social media a reading plan that you can join us through the YouVersion Bible app. You can join me in it, and we'll read through the book of Mark together. It's an eight-day plan, so by the next Sunday you're here, you'll have read through most of the life of Jesus. And when Jim and Ben are talking about it, you don't have to be like, what's the context of that? You can be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy a little bit. And you can decide if there's something worth throwing your nets out for. Or maybe you're the person who's like, okay, Jesus, I think you're Lord. You're God, you're king. I'll, I'll let you run my life. But honestly, like, I don't think I'm worth it. Like, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Maybe you're there and you're like, I don't, I don't know how God could use me. I don't see how that's possible. I, another guy I talked to was like, hey, I'm, I'm going through a really rough season and I'm trying to follow Jesus, but some people are telling me that all I'm doing is, is making things worse. And here, here's what I said. Like, well, you follow Jesus the best you can. You follow him the best you can, and here's the thing. He's telling you, hey, I want to be in this with you. He doesn't promise that it'll all be easy. What he says is, I will, I will be there. Because if you're following someone, you always arrive there with them. Whatever you go through, Jesus is going to be there. And so maybe you're the person who's like, hey, I, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. I don't, know what, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to start following Jesus. How about this? Why don't you join a group and start working it out with some people? Or if you've been following Jesus for a long time and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty good. Great, jump into a group and lead it. Help some other people figure out their next steps. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're like me and you're like, I know, I know what my next step is and it's not any of those. And I don't know if I want to do it. Me too. <laughs> and now I have to try because I've said all this in front of all of you. <laughs> it's one step. What's your, what's your step? Is it, is it coming to, to just listen to Jesus and give him a chance to speak into your life? Is it figuring out, hey, what's, what, what's something I can do and, and getting to know him and seeing if he's trustworthy? Or is it, is it maybe stepping into a group and figuring out, hey, how, how can my life look like more than what it's looked like? Because God actually made you to tell the world about a unique part of him. And I think that's cool. You were made to give glory to God. That's the, that's the old Christian way of saying it. But the bottom line is, man, God wants to do something in and through you that people will look at and say, man, God is awesome. He's amazing. So let's trust Jesus and we'll, we'll let him worry about where we end up. Because I think he's good. So we're gonna, in just a minute, sing this song and it's called, What a Beautiful Name. And the, the lyrics in it are all about like, hey, Jesus is good. Here's what Jesus is like. It, this is a beautiful name because he's an awesome, awesome God. He, he does good things. He's powerful. He's kind. He knows me and, and he saved me. And so as we sing this, here's the thing. If you're like, I don't have any next step. I don't know what it is. Maybe your next step is, is just to tell God what you think of him. A lot of times that's what we're doing in worship. It's not like, hey, I'm singing these songs so I'll get more emotional. It's like, hey, it's giving me a chance to tell God, tell God hey, you're good. C.S. Lewis, the guy with that other quote, has another great one that's like, you know, we don't actually ever get to enjoy anything fully until we've praised it. And that makes sense, right? Like you see a good movie, you gotta tell people about it. You watch Bird Box and you gotta like put your <laughs> blindfolds on and tell everybody on the internet, like, look what I tried. Four of you watched Bird Box, that's good. So as, as we sing this song, here's the thing. I'm, I, you, maybe you're like me and you're not much of a hand raiser. That's okay. But if there's something in here and you're like, hey, th that's good. I get, I get that. Like, yeah, God, you are powerful. You are good. W one time I heard somebody say, hey, when we raise our hands, it's not for us. It's saying, hey, God, you're worth this. It's like, yeah, touchdown. That was good. All right, you know? And so if, if you hear something, you don't have to raise your hand, but just like, he, you can or, or you can just sing and say like, man, God, you're good. That is you. You are powerful. Maybe that's the step. What's your step? Because it just takes one step, whether you've known Jesus for two days or 20 years, it's one step. It's follow me. And then we'll take the next step and the next step and the next step together. Let me pray for us. God, I love you and you are really good. And I want to follow you like that just one step after another. And as I've done that, God, you've proven to me that you're faithful and that you care about me. You've shown me that what you have to say actually honestly is better for me. 
And it's not because you want me to follow rules. It's because you have a good idea of who I am and how, how you made me to work and how, how you made me to show your goodness. And so God, would you please help us to do that? Would you please help us to see who you made us to be and help us to show how good you are? And as, as we hear that and we're like, man, I don't know if I'm, if I'm worth it. Would you tell us like, hey, I know who I made you to be. Would you remind us of that? God, I want people to walk out of here knowing not that like, hey, you'd better follow Jesus, but man, Jesus wants to invite you. He's here with you. He's going to walk beside you because you are. Help us to know that and to trust you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.